How's it going, everybody? Welcome into yet another episode of Debate Night. We are back once again with a new set of topics and analysts. Uh, we'll get right to it. Let's introduce everybody. Brody Smith in the house. Yeah, I knocked down a tree today, so feeling good. Uh, brought me back to my summer camp days. Um, good times. Shout out to Camp Laurel South up in Maine. Uh, Man of the people went back, read the comments. This past week, it wasn't really too much uh, debate on things that were said. Top comment was they want to see the Yuli Big Germ Nate Sexton show. Uh, respect okay. to all of our panelists here and respect to all of our future and past panelists. But the people want to see that. Um, so, Trevor, you let me know what I need to do to make that happen. If we can somehow get all three of their schedules to line up for this show, that would be great. Um, Jack is also here, and Brody, I think he has something to say to you. Yeah, I mean, I'm a last-minute fill-in, so I was like, you know what? This is the best time, uh, other than any other time, to go completely off the dome like Brody has been pestering me about. Um, so I just read the questions for the first time about 15 minutes before we jumped on, so... It is straight straight dome tonight, which means Brody will need to come up with something else to yell at me for for the next hour. Jack, here's the thing, man of the people here, man of the people. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to help you out, brother. I'm trying. I, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to go back and watch that watch that episode and look at all the comments. I was trying to help you out to let you know people don't want to hear people just read an essay. They just don't want to hear it. And uh, I was right. So I'm just trying to help you out. <laughs> I have, I have no ill will towards you. Just trying to help you out. Anywho, <laughs> anywho, um, we'll see what happens today. Uh, Matt that is also un, joining us. Unsolicited advice is great, Brody. I appreciate it. I mean, it is a show that we're trying to get people to listen to. There's a lot anywho, of podcasts that you can go on that no one listens to if you want to jump on those. Anyways, uh, Matt is also joining us today. Hey, guys. I also am a last-minute hop in here i didn't know that so you're definitely getting the some heck interesting is going debates on this when, week when me and jack me and jack are gonna say the stupidest crap you've ever heard in your entire life man i'll tell you jack, what happened. we've got we've got people ghosting me we've got hunter trying to go to his niece's oh, no. graduation or something like everybody just just abandoned ship tonight it's just what happened oh, and we're gonna just see the raw talent of our of our panelists here uh dustin was not a, a last minute fill-in so he's gonna be ready to rock yeah, hey, I'm excited to be back. My my debate night game has been a lot like my disc golf game lately, fulls of highs and lows, but tonight's going to be a high because we're going to bring this thing home. Okay, I love it. I love it. Well, let's get into our first topic. This has been talked about a lot um, over the past week. Um, pretty polarizing announcement from the PDJ here. The Champions Cup has been moved for 2025 to Swenson Park, the site of the OTB Open. Many pros have already voiced their opposition to this move, and it seems overall unpopular. So here's your challenge. Okay, it'd be, it would be too easy to just say, is this a good move? But I think most people agree on that. So here's your challenge. Let's say you're hired to run this tournament in 2025, but you can't change the venue. You're stuck where you're at. What is your strategy to create excitement and preserve the very short legacy of this major? What are you going to do with the hand that you've been dealt? Brody Smith. Are you, I might not under, understand this question. Are you saying if I'm the tournament director of, uh, of uh, the Champions Cup that's going to be at Swinson Park? What yes. would I do? Correct. What would I do for next year? You can Being do anything but change the venue. At that. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think the first thing you got to do is you have to buff up the course. I think, you know, if any of you guys watched the PGA uh, Championships this past week, a lot of criticism towards that major was the fact of there was no challenge. And again, People don't care, you know, us that are loving to see people like low scores. It's not because we don't want to see birdies. It's just, we don't want to see holes that are played where there is no risk of, you know, going for a t difficult shot. And then, Oh no, you're, you're now a bogey's in play. Like we got to see the risk reward on these holes. And so for me, uh, OTB open, I think is a fine tournament but it's not major tested. You're not going out there and having a lot of holes where you're worrying about your tee shot. And what we saw at Northwood, and I think a lot of people liked at Northwood, is 
you can't take a break at Northwood uh, at Northwood Black or Northwood Gold or whatever they're going to want to call it. There's no holes that you can just say, ah, you know, I can just throw this wherever and we can figure it out. Um, that is OTB open. So my first thing, and I think the most important thing, is I have to figure out a way to buff up the course and then show that to the audience, show that to the people and let them know, hey, this is going to be a serious test of skill um, for four days. Yeah, certainly would uh, would would help to make it more difficult. Uh, Jack, what would you do in this situation? Yeah, so the problem with the move to uh, Swenson Park is that we've known Champions Cup in its short short time here to be the wooded major. Um, and that's just nothing that's going to be able to be replaced at a ball golf course like Swenson Park. Um, but maybe uh, making it the finesse major could work. And how do you do that? You make OB super duper tight. I mean, we're talking like the tightest OB can possibly be. So even though you're playing on an open ball golf course, you still need to have touch. You still need to have finesse. You still need to be able to land the disc in a landing zone. Um, other than that, you know, adding Mandos to things as well. There's a lot of times that uh, at open at open golf course, disc golf courses, holes can get broken really easily. Uh, these big towering hyzers can get thrown that just totally uh, break the hole entirely. And if you're putting a Mando on nearly every single hole, then uh, you're keeping it. So, no, this is the line and you need to be able to hit it. Is it fun? Probably not. Is it going to be as great as, a, uh, as spectators to see? I don't know. It's definitely going to frustrate the players, but it's going to frustrate them in a different way than playing in the woods of Northwood um, do. So I think it could could work out that way. Yeah, um, certainly, certainly would have to add a lot of obstacles to that course to tighten it up. Um, Matt, let's see. Let's say you're in the same situation. What are you doing? Okay, so making the course harder is kind of like the go-to. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to make the course harder. It has to be a major, and we consider majors as let's make this a tough course. But in Champions Cup's case, um, they're ne going to need to make this course seem like something special, something unique, um, and something that doesn't have history, but make it seem like it has a really rich history. And you're lucky enough that you at least have the same general course to do that with. So my goal would be like, you got to advertise, aside from beefing up the course, that's obvious. You've got to advertise like, we've got unique winners, try and push something as far as that goes. Uh, unique shot shapes, uh, unique golf being played. Something to make people care about a course that just got ruined from one of the most well-known wooded majors of disc golf's history. Um, anything else you do as far as that goes, You've got to do the default stuff that you do to any course that's for a major. But the biggest thing is making that audience care really quickly so that they'll watch and they'll come to the event. Um, and right now, I think, like, I don't know how they're going to do that. In my head, I would try and make it seem like this is a really unique course with unique winners, even if that's not really necessarily the case if you look back in the last, like, 20 years or something like that or however long it's been around. I think you're actually on a decent track there. I think the marketing around the course, um, it, it plays into this a lot. It, you know, they, they've got, you know, you're stuck with the course. So trying to make it seem as glamorous as possible is one of the best things you can do. Um, Dustin, what do you think? You know, I think it's, it's interesting to think about because, you know, we, we, we have labeled this, this major as the wooded major, you know, it's only been around a few years. Um, a lot of things around the PDA, PDGA's control. Now, I'm not a PDGA fanboy, but we got to understand there's some beetles that were attacking some trees, and they got to respond, and they got to do something at the end of the day. So um, I don't think it was just their complete desire to, hey, let's run to California, let's put this major there. They could have chose something else. I agree. There could have been better options. But they're trying to make the most of this situation, I think. So first of all, just putting the, name, uh, putting, putting the major label on it is going to help draw more attention and more eyes to this particular course. I do think with the event, you're going to have to add more out of bounds. You're going to have to create some more difficult shots to kind of force the players outside of their normal routines on this course. Because if they're just going to throw the same shots on the same holes as they've always been doing, uh, it's going to get real boring and stale real quick. And we're going to be a lot of predictions. I would maybe reach out to a lot of course designers. I don't know them all. I don't know their names and have them come out and look at the property and say, is there any small changes we can make or even some big changes to give it a new flavor and a new a new taste for people to try and experience. Um, 
you're just going to have to do some things. But having that label as a major is going to be a big already boost for it because people are just going to naturally pay more attention. Now, I know Brody likes people dressing up on the course, so we could always put some people in some Beatle costumes and have them running around. And if one of them gets nailed by a disc, then, hey, maybe we get a little donation to the course back in uh, W.R. Jackson to get these mm -hmm. things taken care of. But uh, not really. Don't do that, please. But we just got to make it fun. We got to make it exciting. We got to build build some new suspense. Well, I mean, the, I guess the good news is as far as course redesign, uh, well, it's it's what everybody doesn't like about this course, that it's being held at a golf course, but it does also mean it's a wide open property. There's a lot of things it could do. I think everybody would be pretty shocked if the exact same course showed up um, for the um, – for the major as we've been playing for OTB. Um, forgive the points lagging all over the place, by the way. I'm like trying to dial them in, but there's latency. Um, we're going to move on to our next topic. So the Q series, brand new tour of the Disc Golf Pro Tour, an arm of the Disc Golf Pro Tour, I guess you should say, um, meant for kind of players trying to earn their tour card. Well, Aaron Gossage took down the first Q series event of 2024, though he is already a top 25 player on tour. Do you see any current or future problems with the participation of these elite players in Q series events? Simple question, kind of broad. What are your thoughts on this, Jack? Yeah, I'm going to say I do. Um, I, I do see this as a problem. The way I look at the Q series events is they are like the minor league baseball affiliates of the disc golf pro tour. And the fact is I grew up, a lot of people, uh, grow up in areas where there's a minor league baseball team. For me, it was Central Pennsylvania in Altoona, Pennsylvania, which is the double A affiliate of the Pittsburgh Pirates. I got to see guys like Andrew McCutcheon, Garrett Cole, um, and uh, let's see, Starling Marte, other guys, O'Neill Cruz, play baseball uh, in Altoona before they got to the pros, to the Pirates, and onto the Yankees, Astros, and everywhere else that pillages the Pirates farm system. But – the fact is, if we if we're looking at these Q series events and we've got all of these big name pros that are going and playing them, then what we're there to actually see, at least for me, is to see these local pros that are trying to put their put their neck out there, step out there, and try and get it get on to the pro tour. I know a lot of guys from local scenes that I've been a part of that uh, actually played in the 303 Open, flew out to play the 303 Open, and you know what? I would have been much more excited to. Uh, pay closer attention to it if uh, I was getting to see them and not seeing guys like Gossage that are on tour all the time anyway. Okay, fair enough. So not a huge fan of the pro players. Uh, Matt, what are your opinions on this? Uh, I'm, I'm probably in a similar place to Jack here. So in my head right now, maybe this happens once or twice. Um, maybe the distinction of Q series makes a lot of pros not consider playing it. Maybe the already full season makes them consider not playing these style of events. Um, and we don't have to worry about this for the rest of the season. But maybe pros play in every single one of these and just obliterate every single time. Well, then, just as Jack said, we're not showing off these pros that are up and coming. We're just showing the same guys for an extra week. Um, and in my head, if you really want to push that as a building to being on the pro tour level, you've got to limit that in some ways, whether it's limit the amount of events a pro can come and play in the Q series or just limit that in general. I don't like love the just, Hey, you can play these if you want. Um, if every week a pro is going to come that's already on tour and win this thing um, and kind of not highlight the players we're trying to highlight and the players we're trying to get with a Q series. So we'll see as, if this keeps happening as time goes on, but if it does, um, which I think it probably will occasionally, at least, uh, I would want some more management of that. Okay. So Matt also looking for some stricter entry rules. Uh, Dustin, what are your thoughts on the Q series, um, stipulations? Well, in the question, Trevor, you asked two things. You asked currently, is it a problem in the future? Is it a problem? And I'm going to go out and say in the future, I'm going to address that first. In the future, it's a problem. I don't think pros can sh should continue to play on the Q series down the road, but that might be several years from now. Uh, you know, there's nothing in the rules right now that say they can't do it. Uh, it actually says they can if they're willing. It was right there in the announcement. Now, it does say that any of the uh, they won't be eligible for any of the benefits and stuff if they already have their tour car. So they're protecting the other players in that way. There was prize money. It looked like Aaron Gossage walked away with the biggest prize. You know, that might hurt some pocketbooks of some of those other players, but they're not out there just for the cash. They're out there to get that tour card for the future. 
Where I will say is I'm okay with it now because chances are if Aaron Gossage didn't go out and win this tournament, we probably wouldn't be talking about the Q Series tournament at all on the show. You know, so it is bringing attention to it. It is bringing some eyeballs to the, the, the thing. It's giving us something to talk about. But there's another thing I want to address, too. There was two other names that just jumped out on me on that list. is Colton Montgomery and Joel Freeman. Both those guys played at that event, too. And they did not win, and they did not come in second, and they did not come in third. Sorry, I don't remember exactly where they came in. But it also gave, when we look at that leaderboard and we see who did what, it gives us the opportunity to see some of these local pros, some of these regional players outdoing some of our pros. And you know, if the pro wants to take the risk and step down and, and play against that level, and, you know, they may come up at the bottom of the leaderboard if they're not careful. And, uh, you know, when you're when you're – Trying to build a fan base, you're trying to build a following to keep your career afloat, it might not always be the best idea. So it's really in the player's hands. Okay, fair points, Dustin. Um, yeah, I think a lot of good points there. Uh, Brody, wrap it up for us. What are your thoughts on this whole Q-Series thing? I agree with what Jack and Matt were saying to a point, but I think they were going about it the wrong way. Um, so like Jack was saying that, you know, minor league baseball – like if Mike Trout said, hey, I'm going to show up to this minor league baseball game this week, it would be the most attended minor league baseball game of all time. So like the idea that Aaron Gossage, Ricky, Paul, Calvin, Eagle, any of these top players showing up, and this is kind of what I saw a lot from the comments of people talking about this. I posted on Twitter too asking if you know pros should be able to play in local events. And a lot of the people that said yes were either competitors that say that were basically saying, I would love to have the opportunity of playing on the same card as X, right? And then you would also have fans being like, I live in the area. It would be awesome to go out and watch that person play. So I think there are benefits in that. And really, it's going to boil down to the point of where eventually pros just don't want to do it. Like that, I think is at the end of the day is like where we need to get to. If you're making enough money and you're doing fine on the pro tour, you're not going to want to play in these lower level events. Um, because I do think it brings actually a lot of positive to the events. Like it, it, it brings fans that would probably come out and watch Aaron Gossage play that probably aren't going to come out and watch, you know, all the other people there. So I don't know. I, I it is an interesting one. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of people made gut reactions when they first heard it, and then you kind of look into it a little more, and you you, know, you realize, okay, the points don't count towards them. The points go down. But then it's like, yeah, the prize money, you know, Dustin mentioned, like that's kind of a bummer. It's like these are meant to be bridge that is a kind bummer. of events. And, yeah, like Gossage is going to – like it could – it's it's one of those things like Brady's talking about. These pros, there's not enough of them that are so well off that if they see a chance to scoop up 4,500 bucks or 2,500 bucks or whatever it might be for first place, they're not going to go try and scoop that up. You know, that's, that's not where we're at in the sport. And if you give them disc golf and it's in their way, you know, ha had there been, had that Vegas event been a Q series, there would have been the same amount of pros there probably. Yeah, they all um, probably would have so, been playing it. Yeah. So that's just to the nature of the event right now. I do think it, it's it can be nice to have that sprinkle of names there to give yourself comparisons. But Jack, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, have I a would rebuttal. say I don't know, the, but go ahead, Jack. The, the worst thing the worst thing that we could see, in in my opinion, is a Q series event where a player is tied with Aaron Gossage on a last hole, and they have the chance to win it, and they lay up intentionally because they because they're going to get their tour card and they want to make sure that they guarantee their second place behind him to get their tour card and we have a pro that gets first place um instead of that person that because they laid up for their tour card right like if they're laying up they should be laying up for the win or they should be running it for the win and i think that that also makes it like if that's if that's what had happened and then if we're looking at it like okay gosh did you won but like you know what like it's not really what, a spectator event though here? yeah who cares no one no one's watching that yeah at this point it, it, i see barely point, any Jack. people watching live disc golf on the pro tour i mean i i see the point but yeah it is it's 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 different it's tough to gauge right now when you're making these products that like 
yeah long term and yeah, and like, to be fair like the q series events if they had a the right field they probably would be a little more eyeballs on them but it's a weird one um all right we're gonna move on to our next topic here so this is fan submitted uh this is just um i had to throw this in here because i just love when people rant on the pdga it, it just makes me laugh so this is this is somebody typing this this is not me and then i had my kind of excerpt in there but uh this this fan said It's so tiresome seeing the PDJ making stupid decision after stupid decision and the community being held hostage to their incompetence. Very well, very eloquently put there. Should the DGPT make their own player organization and disconnect from the PDJ? So my question then is, what do you think is stopping them from doing this if you think they should? Um, Because, you know, they seem to have a lot of power. You know, what's what's going on there? So, Matt, what are your thoughts? Uh, I don't think they should um you know if they're making a bad if they're doing things that we generally think of are stupid or dumb our our question should be is the pdga bad or is the leadership within the pdga bad right is the pdga bad or are their policies bad um they have a lot of built up uh history and other things that are ultimately in some ways helpful to our sport and maybe we just have some crappy policies um Maybe we just have some crappy uh, leaders in there. And the move of let's disconnect from them and leave because they've ticked us off for the last time as viewers uh, is a little weird. I mean, players are going to say this. Players might agree and all that. I think there's probably an in-between. I don't know where that in-between is. Yeah, I'm, do I look at this decision the PDGA makes and I think, dude, you got to be dumber than a box of rocks to make that decision. Yeah, all the time. But I still think that like, uh, to throw it all aside when maybe there's some bad policies or bad leaderships that we could instead get active and try and make a way to change those things. That's a better move um, to retain most of those players. And then also, you know, maybe have some good faith moving forward as the PDGA, but doing that's going to be tough to do. Uh, I don't know if the move is let's kick them out and start over from scratch. Hey, I mean, fair point. I mean, to be, to be honest, like, yes, the, the PDGA, like what frustrates us is usually just the decisions they make and some of the policies, but you know, any organization could make frustrating decisions, not inherently just the PDGA. That's the problem, I guess. Um, Dustin, what are you thinking? No. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think they should separate at all. I think these are way too early in the relationship to be given up on it and moving on. I think in, in reality, disc golf is not a big enough sport and it's not a big enough organization for them to split and think that both are going to survive or even one's going to survive and thrive. I think right now they way it's set up the way they interact, they need each other to be successful. And I don't think the money's there for one to run off without the other. Now we'll say this and saying all that, I definitely think the, the, the pro tour needs to flex its muscles a little bit more in the decision making and kind of push their agendas and push some of their, their thoughts and stuff and share. And like Matt said, you know, the leadership of the PDGA, are they listening? Are they being cooperative? And if not, new leadership needs to be put in place. I will say this though. uh, One thing I think the PDGA does need to do to, and and the D and the disc golf pro tour to further this relationship and make it better is I think they need to slow down, first of all, before they announce decisions and make quick, rash, uh, unrash decisions. But they need to um, ad- advise the players. They need to talk to players. And I don't know if there really is something in place. I haven't heard about it. I could be wrong. But maybe the, the pros need to elect representation that goes and talks to the uh, pro tour, that talks to the PDGA before they these decisions that. are made. And maybe it's not like a three-headed uh, monster instead of just two heads and, and that representation would be better to give that feedback. So I, I think it's too, too, way too early to separate. I, I just don't think either would survive the way they want to, but, uh, but the GGP, the, the pro tour needs to, needs to step up and flex their muscles a little bit more in determining these things. Yeah. The pro tour definitely tends to be pretty tentative when it comes to those sort of things, Brody, you're usually pretty passionate about this. So what are your thoughts? Well, they, to answer Dustin's question, I don't know if I don't know if this program can hear when someone else is talking. Dustin was saying that he doesn't know if there's like a player council. There is, so there is um, a selected group. Or I think it's actually more of a voluntary who wants to be a part of this group. I think there's like six or seven pros that have kind of more of a direct line. I guess you can say with the Disc Golf Pro Tour and maybe with the PDGA as well. So they already have that. I would say the first thing is the biggest issue right now is the PDGA wants to keep everyone under the same umbrella. 
They want amateurs. They want juniors. They want uh, masters players. They want pros. They want everyone to be together. And it's this whole this idea of like disc golf. We're all together. And like that just doesn't work when things grow. Like you eventually have to grow out of that. And right now, I think that is kind of the next because everyone's been talking about it. Disc golf pro tour, it's 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 plateaued. There hasn't been really that much growth growth over the last year or two, and I think that is really the next thing that could potentially get it to the next level is them saying, "Hey, we're going to actually kind of do our own thing and see how it works." We still love disc golf and in, in all the different ways that you can play it at different levels, but we're going to do our own thing. And I do have a question for Dustin. He says that you said that the disc golf pro tour and the PDGA need each other. Can you give me a couple things of why the disc golf pro tour needs the PDGA? Um, I, I mean, that's the way that's set up right now. I mean, I know they would have to take the time to establish like a players association and, and do different things like that to create their own tournament and payouts. And even going to the amateurs, I guess they don't really too worried about amateurs because it's uh, they're not worried about the amateur. Tour. They're literally yeah. why do they need it's, it's why do they tour. need the PGA for payouts? Yeah, it's literally just, just I mean, an the resources that, that the PGA has been building over the years uh, of existence. I think are still valuable to what the pro tour is trying to do. So I just think it's How? mutual beneficial How? to both to have the How? You just keep saying they're valuable, but you're not giving actually any reasons of why they're valuable. Well, like I'm going to be also not familiar to getting into the, the the full structures of of the way it works there. I've never never been a part of the tour or anything like that, so I don't understand completely the way the the pro tour itself takes care of all of its individuals. Whereas the PDGA, I know they because of their history, because of their time, yeah, they've made a lot of bad decisions. They don't always have the best outlook, but when you're talking about trying to transfer that some of the stuff, I mean, maybe the pro tour is just about the payouts. I mean. I guess that's what they where they transfer develop. what stuff like the rules uh, the, any of the infrastructure that PDJ has there's not much that that but that that can be something that the that they, that they can still say hey we're going to follow these set of rules that the PJ has and we're going to tweak a few things for us and then that's that's our rule book literally copy and paste potentially is there a legality issue with copying and pasting it <laughs> I don't know rules no idea. I don't know. It's certainly I mean, I don't not. Even think in the long run, you just want to copy and, and paste. Sure, You're going to want to sure, develop your own set of I'm rules sure and stuff. PDGA, that's going to take some time. What? Dude, this program is – it makes it almost impossible to talk back and forth to one another. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I I can't well, I can't hear anything well, Dustin said. Let's hear, from, let's hear from Jack on what he's got to say on this topic first. Yeah, the fact is, Dustin, I have to agree with Brody about the PDGA and the DGPT. The fact is the DGPT does not need the PDGA because until 2021, the Disc Golf Pro Tour was not the tour of the PDGA. They were their own thing. They were their own governing body. Um, their events were sanctioned, but if you go back and you look, they're all listed as A tiers under wins for players. They're not listed as elite series because they weren't under the PDGA. Fact is, the Disc Golf Pro Tour doesn't need the PDGA. The PDGA needs the Disc Golf Pro Tour. If the if the Disc Golf Pro Tour left the PDGA, then the PDGA is scrambling to find out, well, if we need to have a tour, what are we going to do? And the fact is, a lot of the events that were national tour events became Pro Tour events. From everything that we've heard, the, pro, the, the staff of those events would rather be part of the Disc Golf Pro Tour than a national tour that the PDGA puts on. So the fact is, if the DGPT left... Uh, the PDG, the PDGA, then the pro scene of disc golf, the high level pro scene of disc golf uh, vanishes from, from the PDGA's grasp. Now, that being said, I don't think the DGPT needs to separate themselves. I think that um, the relationship that they have right now works. I don't think that the DGPT, um, other than a few rules here or there that uh, we would all love to change, like the, I don't know, the five minutes rule to your tea time um, and some others, but Outside of that, the PDGA isn't really doing any, anything that's hindering what the Disc Golf Pro Tour does. Yeah, I, it, it's a weird relationship because, uh, you know, you, when you talk about, like, the, the dependency on one versus the other, obviously the Pro Tour is the, like, known as, like, the bigger product, I guess, as far as, like, notoriety. But the PDGA, at the end of the day, you know, they make their revenue off of our memberships, you know, and our memberships – 
are are needed because of how big the am side is and how many tournaments are hosted um and the player ratings and things like that so it's a weird one where it's like you wonder if i i know that the pro tour a huge part of their strategy has been like let's make changes but not ruffle a ton of feathers along the way and i think that them keeping the pdj alongside was partially like okay it'll just be easier this way you know the pdj has been around a long time they're basically since the inception of like pro disc golf so i just imagine they have their roots and their claws really deep into the game at this point like i i would just be curious to see if the pro tour were to say like we're done we're moving aside like what kind of repercussions would come out of that if any you know i you just never know when you're dealing with such an old organization relative to the sport but like why does the pdga need to have a like if if the disc golf pro tour is like hey we're gonna do our own thing we don't want you guys nearly as involved we're gonna yeah. use you know the rules that you kind of have set forth but then we're gonna be able to do our own thing um because like right now if the pdga came out and said hey before you tee off you have at a pdj sanctioned event you have to do 10 push-ups yeah we would have to be doing 10 push-ups at the disc golf pro tour like that that's where it's weird is like the PDGA should do their own thing. And to me, what would actually be the most beneficial to the members money that the members are paying is that the PDGA was actually worried in doing that. Like they shouldn't be concerned with the pro the pro tour. Like uh, my that, honest that's opinion where it's is like, it, they don't, they don't need their own events. They don't need their right. own tour. They don't need any of that. Well, right. My honest opinion, though, is I think it just comes down to politics and the want of ownership. Like I said, when you've been around so long and like sure. for for 30 years, you know, PJ is the top dog in disc golf and turning that over and giving that up. I just don't think they want to lose control. Uh, that's that's my honest opinion on what I because I, I agree. I think the PGA's yeah, I mean, they, main they, initiative I, I think, should be to grow I think disc they messed golf. up, though. Yeah, they they if yeah. they didn't want to lose control, they should have squashed the disc golf pro tour. Uh, before the disc golf pro tour got up because you look at these other organizations in this and in, in other sports and like they don't have someone that's like got their claws in their back telling them what to do well you can't yeah and the thing is the pdj at the end of the day like the nfl does what the tour. nfl wants to do right you couldn't they couldn't squash the pro tour because the pro tour was funded and the people will go where the money is you know i've said this a billion times if, if a new tour yeah, no, arose tomorrow and there was more money everybody leave the pro tour too it's just, you know, that's just, oh, that's just sure. how it works. So anyways, yeah, it, it's, it's a very interesting ongoing thing, um, and relationship between them. And I wonder, yeah, how long it will continue it the way it is. Uh, we got one more topic. I, I didn't mean to topic. go that hard on you. I'm sorry. It's all good, buddy. Hey, I'm learning some stuff too, man. Got to figure it no, out. Well, yeah. Well, it just, man, I, I, I just hear that a lot of times is like the, you know, the PDJ, the, and we've I'm been like, institutionalized. I never hear really reasons. <laughs> That's what, cause it's in our, yeah, it's in our we, membership. When you open the email, it, it, I can't keep saying things like this. I'm going to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you open the magazine, not the right there's words, pixie dust that goes in your but, eyes and changes your thoughts. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to end up with a cease and desist. Um, all right. We got one more topic for our final topic. You're going to stick around for our final topic, aside from the lag we've been experiencing, because it is a very this interesting is one. wild. Um, but <laughs> I think we're all final... we all turned into Hunter. Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, that's true. So mm -hmm. this last topic here, we're going to talk a little bit more about the uh, the golf properties for disc golf courses. So many disc golf fans and players alike have gotten on board with the use of golf properties for disc golf courses. But one common complaint still remains. It's difficult to have context for where the disc is being aimed or landing in relation to the hole. Oftentimes shots land and you have to wait for the commentary team to let you know if it's a good shot or not. So I want to know what can these tournaments do to combat this visual hurdle, whether it be practical or computer effects, what would be your strategy? Cause I don't know about you, but I get lost watching these drives on par fours land. And I'm like, I don't know if that was the best drive of the day or the worst. Uh, Dustin, what do you think? All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with the idea that they can afford this and that they could implement it and that there's sure. people on the team that can do it. Okay. So I'm going to say that first. But first of all, quit changing cameras in the middle of a flight of a disc. I would love you just to hold that camera. I know it's been talked about on this show many times. I've heard Brody mention it lots of times. 
everybody agrees, let's see the fly of the disc and let's enjoy the fly of the disc because that's one of the things we love as disc golfers is seeing that disc fly. But I would love when they're leading up to a hole, I do appreciate the fly through to show me the full path of the hole and everything, but I would love to see a graphic that's more accurate to what the actual course is, or maybe it's even a bird eye view from a drone picture, but go on there. And I don't know if you just want to highlight certain areas of the hole on the screen, if you want to give the commentator a, a, one of those teleprompter pins and let them draw circles showing me where those things are, but then have that maybe in the core of the screen and then have somebody interacting with it that shows where Calvin's throw land or where Gavin's throw landed in relation to those highlighted spots that are deemed kind of some of the best areas. Now, I know with this course, there's a lot of areas that people could land and be successful, but if our commentators get out there and we're talking to the pros, seeing where they're aiming, where they're throwing, plus their own experiences can just, you know, can look at those holes and say, these are the prime locations. And then we see that. I don't need to see the whole disc, a little computer disc fly. I mean, that'd be fun if we could, but let's just, you know, show where they landed. Um, even if it's, like I said, the teleprompter with little X showing, this is where he landed right here. And he's going to have this type of shot coming up next. Because a lot of times they do get lost. You do get confused. You don't know if it was a good shot, bad shot, and you don't know what's coming next. Yeah, I, I definitely think that would be a, a good step in the right direction for sure. Um, Brody, what do you think they could do? All right, everyone stay with me here. We're going to compare golf and disc golf once again. Now, something that golf struggles with is being able to actually show you the flight the entire time. And so what they have done is they have now incorporated what they have these trackers that are like live. I don't really know how they work. It's actually insane that they can do it, but it actually gives you the flight of the golf ball so you can actually see it. Now, the thing that golf has that disc golf doesn't is golf is an extremely hard sport. Everyone knows if you're 100 yards away from a hole, the hole can be in the middle of the green with no trouble around, and everyone knows that is a difficult shot for the average layman. Um, so golf, they can boost stuff up, and they can talk about there's a bunker here. You don't want to short sight yourself, all that. But at the end of the day, hitting a golf ball from 100 yards away to two feet is impressive, and people will love it. Throwing a disc from 300 feet away to two feet is not impressive. It's not difficult. It's not something that's crazy. So what needs to happen is we need to show how difficult that was by the shot shape that they need to do, the low ceiling that there was. And my perfect example of this, and I, I will like to uh, invoke my extension on this uh, question, please. Thank you for the lag. Um, perfect example is here, hole 11, hole 11. Does everyone know hole 11 at the OTB? The par four? Yeah, yes. The big water carry to start? Mm -hmm. I, it's so have, hard to I, give any sort of response so i, I, I would, i'm waiting for response and it's just like heck yeah brother so go lag. ahead go ahead we we, um, we know you we agree with you okay <laughs> okay Speak um, to us. <laughs> so that hole when you look at it when you look at that hole you're think i think for a viewer if you're if you've never played that hole you're just thinking guys are trying to throw it as far as they can over the water but based off how that sh tree is short right and those two trees are short of the basket, the where you land is so specific on what you can do. Whether you can throw the forehand under the trees or you can throw the hyzer over the water or you can throw the flex forehand, or flex backhand over the water or go under the tree on the right. And that's something that I just don't think they do a great job of expressing when a shot lands 520 feet away from the tee of, oh, no, that's not going to be a good spot. That's going to be very difficult because of X, Y, and Z. And I just don't think they're able to really do that good okay. right now. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Jack, what would your – I don't even know if I want to make it to the finals. This this is – this is I'm having I'm having problems over here, guys. Sorry. <laughs> this is wild. We're all having a great time. We're um, having a great time. Okay, I'm gonna go because I'm seeing the clock content. dropping. Um, yeah, so so one thing <laughs> is that you have 40 seconds is, left. There's this lag. Is strictly, this is strictly an electronic thing. Um, I attended the Waco Annual Charity Open, and out at Lake Waco, when I was watching, um, I was able to see where a good shot was and where a bad shot was be, when I was there on the ground. So we're talking about specifically when you're watching. Uh, when you're watching disc golf, when you're watching on YouTube, watching disc golf network, whatever. I think uh, 
Dustin was almost there when he said we need to stop changing cameras to um, where the disc is flying. Um, I'm actually going to say we should keep changing cameras, but instead of changing to them where the disc is coming towards the camera and towards the basket, but not seeing the context of where the basket is, facing the other way so that we're getting a better view of the disc as it's flying down the fairway towards the basket. A lot of the times when we see a camera, camera operator turn around because a shot is beyond where they are, we get even better context as to how good the shot is, not just because they turned around, but because when they turn, then we can see where the basket is in relation to where the disc is. So I think that would be a really big thing. Um, I also think that uh, electronically, I mean, we, when you watch football, they put lines on the field before every play, and then they disappear. It's this crazy thing. But uh, if Disc Golf Network had the uh, technology to do that, then that would be a big help as well to sort of mark. Because remember, they, they used to do that with the Google Earth, where it was like, these were the shots that are in the birdie zone, right? Well, do that as the shot is happening so we actually can see that. Hey, there are, you know, they, they have flirted around with some fun ideas of like showing like the, okay, these are where these discs landed, but then sometimes they just don't do it. It's like sometimes they're like, ah, that was too much work. The, uh, so you're saying like having the catch cam <laughs> be in a position to where Flip. you're still tracking the disc going no, in saying. front of them? Yeah, so like we have the T-pad and then 250 yeah. feet down the fairway, we have another camera that's still facing down the fairway. Yeah, not okay, that's an interesting idea. Oh. So it's a catch cam, but you're, you're still, saying, the disc you... is... I actually don't hate that for I... drives. Like approaches, obviously, if you're at the basket, it makes sense to be at the basket, but I don't hate that because it's like, instead of having to right, change directions, the directions, you keep the fairway like context. Wait, yeah, why wouldn't like, you just change the, it? Why wouldn't you just have... Par five? I'm thinking of the first par five this last weekend and like all of the shots. I'm like, okay, that's a shot that came and skipped and skipped and then it stopped moving. I have no idea. But if instead of having the camera operator 500 feet down the fairway, having the camera operator 250 to 300 and then rotating to follow, seeing the end of its flight going down the fairway instead of coming towards them, then we'd actually get better context of what's around. What are the trees they're going to have in front of them that we might not see? Where's the basket in relation to where this disc is landing? I actually don't hate that. I don't hate that. As long as they're in the right position. Because, like, I mean, Brody, you, you want, get it. So just, you would be you would be facing I, I, the same I, I, direction not, as the next shot, basically. You already so, have a cam. I know, but you already have a camera that's doing that. The yeah, but they're all the way back tee. at the tee. That's what I'm saying is this one will be closer, so you're getting a better they look at the zoom shot. in. What kind of camera? I see what you're saying. I I I see what you're saying in theory, but you're you're adding someone 250 feet, and shots are going to go all over the place. I thought what he was saying was actually interesting because I actually hate them switching to catch cam. But I thought what he was saying was start with catch cam, have the shot coming at the camera, and then switch to behind the tee so you can actually see where it lands. I thought that's what you were saying, which is still worse. Uh, it's still bad, but it's better than them doing catch cam and having no relation to the basket. That's what I, I thought you were saying. There's definitely an easy, well, interesting well, idea the problem, there because, like, the problem with the problem with just only using the T pad camera at an event like we just saw at Swenson Park, where it is, you know, the low ceiling open or whatever they want to jokingly call it, is because eventually you're going to get to a point that you can't see the disc from where the T pad is. Um, especially once it hits the ground and it's getting ground play, then you want someone that's still showing where the disc is going to end up, but showing where it's going to end up in relation to the basket and actually being able to see it where you might not see that from the tee pad, especially, and that's just on an open course. If you're playing like a wooded course where you have a par four that's going around the corner of the first oh, shot, sure. if you have someone that's only filming down the fairway that or filming from the tee pad, then you'll have no idea. That's an interesting thought. Now, what I, like I, will that, say is, I like that a lot more for wood. I like that a lot what more I will, for woods. For what I will say is that sounds like tough. level 100 difficulty filming to make it like smooth and position yourself correctly. And as we know, they already sometimes struggle to position themselves. But that's an interesting concept. I, I like that concept. Uh, Matt, what concept do you have to bring to the table? I'm bringing the same thing everyone else here is saying, except I'm using a key word here. And we're calling it perspective. You can't tell if a shot is good or bad unless you know where the basket's at or from the basket from the disc. So there's two ways. You can be at the disc's landing location facing the basket. What does that mean? You have four camera operators minimum per hole kind of moving around a lot. Or from the basket to the disc 
from a higher spot so that you can see the perspective of where it lands. Because you can't see a disc in the grass. You can see a disc if it's higher here. But that's what we're all saying. We're all talking about perspective just in crazy ways. Remember, we still have camera operators that are putting their hand in front of the camera and hitting a thumbs down in the middle of uh, a camera shot. We do not have necessarily the power to get this nice, smooth rotation. In my head, we need to focus more on stationary shots that always, always prioritize the perspective of where we are at in relation to the basket. And most of the time, the way that happens is the camera just needs to be higher so we can see the disc instead of the grass it disappears into, even if the grass is super short. Um, but you're going to get stuck on all sorts of in-betweens where can we have perfectly rotating cameras all day long? We probably yeah. can't, although it would be cool. Well, you know, it always comes back down to that that the thing of money. But you're right, the high cameras would be nice too, like having camera towers, um, like you see at you know professional golf events, just because it does that does usually give you better angles. I feel like, yeah, sometimes I don't know, man. I just went through an entire weekend of seeing drives land and being like, well, who who knows who knows where that is in relation to the basket. I just see grass all around. It all it, it doesn't help when you're using the golf properties because then there's greens they, and you're do they what. Sorry, I, I, I'm cutting people off because I feel like they're done no, you're talking good. with the you're lag good. situation. Um, yeah, this is my nemesis right now, lag. Uh, do they have tele, do they use like teleprompter, um, like pens and drawings? Can they do any of that? The people in the booth? Hey, have they uh, have been able to do it? Hey, spoiler ever? alert. You mean like drawing on the screen? Yeah, yeah, so like, you talking about? for example, the par five, the par, the first par five, Jack, that you were talking about, if you have a camera behind that tee and you zoom in as far as you can, which I guess you can't zoom in that far with whatever cameras are using, if I'm sitting there, I can circle and say, this is where you want to land. This is where his disc is. Like you can see, oh, he's like 50 feet left. And then I can highlight, you see these two trees right here? These are going to be in his, like you can... You can give a little bit more context if you're if the commentators are able to do that. Well, I, can yeah, they do I, that? I think probably not. Uh, here's the, they probably can't. But here's how you can do it: buy a two hundred dollar iPad and buy an eighty dollar Apple pencil, and then you can do that <laughs> because you can push all of it through and draw right over it. But they don't have that right now. Silas probably knows some information about this. We have an expert. Well, I mean, can't speak to, to be fair, we're also dealing with uh, commentators that aren't even on site. So there's, I think there's like a long way to go before they can even. Yeah, you do have a struggle there. Because it's like, obviously, I feel like this whole issue is 10 times better whenever we course. play. Yeah, well, whenever we play a course that, like, you know the commentators know, like, the back of their hand, it's always 10 times better because they're very quickly able to be, like, well, ahead of time and once the shot lands, they're able to give you really good context. But anytime it's a course they're not as familiar with, you know, or if you've got commentators that just didn't really, you know, play as many courses, it's it's really hard to get the right perspective. Um, like hole two, do right. you guys know what side of the fairway you want to be on hole two? You guys all watch coverage, I'm, sur I'm sure. Do you guys have any idea what, what side of the fairway on hole two you want to be after your drive? The left side. No. I had a 50-50 chance. Yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> that's see, that's, that's, to me, that's that, great odds, to me, actually. To me, that... To me, that should be just like an automatic, like everyone knows, but certain holes, we know that, right? Like there's certain iconic holes that we know it's like, Ooh, they're going to be really tough. They're going to be pinched, whatever. Yeah. But like on a hole that's open like that, unless you have someone telling you, you want to land on the right hand side, cause it opens it up to the turnover backhand, the forehand, and you're throwing away from the OB and there's not a tree that's going to pinch you off. Like you, if you, until, unless you have someone telling you that you have no idea. Very true. Very true. Which just makes it more boring to watch coverage. All right. We persevered through the lag. We're on to the finals. Dustin, Jack, I think you have the amount of points I tried to give you. Been fighting latency all, <laughs> all episode. You, everybody did a great <laughs> job. Um, this is a very interesting topic, though. So if you if you stuck through it, this is gonna. I'm very curious to hear what you guys have to say about this one because I was throwing it around the office a little bit and everybody kind of had different opinions on it. So we're going to talk about Calvin. 
So Calvin has come on strong now with back-to-back victories, erasing the gap between himself and the one-two punch of A.B. and Gannon this season, kind of getting himself into the mix. He now has proven once again that he's an annual winner on tour and always a force to be reckoned with. Now that he is into his late 20s, where is Calvin on your all-time list? Uh, just MPO in this, in this argument. And if he were to win just one major title this season, how much further would that propel him up this uh, imaginary list? So, yeah, we're talking Calvin Goat Talk. It's it's time to start doing it. Dustin, would you like to go first or second? Uh, I'll go second. Jack, go ahead. All right. Jack, you're on. All right. Well, first of all, you just said it's time to start talking about this, and that's not true because he hasn't won a major, right? We, in our sport, in disc golf, winning a major is what separates you from great to really great. And there are a lot of players in disc golf uh, throughout the history of disc golf that have lived in that great section that you'd think, you know, had had spurts like this. Where on any given weekend, it's like they could be the one, but they never won a major, right? So without Calvin winning a major, it's as, you know, kind of unfortunate as it is being in a sport where we're always trying to uh, make everyone seem like they're the greatest of all time because our sport is so young. We need to have a cutoff, and he, I would have a cutoff there where he's you know, just a guy compared to the likes of those that have won majors. Now, if he were to win a major um, this season, that would propel him significantly. I mean, that would propel him in my book past, um, you know, past guys like Schustrich, uh, past um, guys like Gannon Burr, who's won a major, definitely past Presnell, obviously. No offense to, to A. Prez, Prez for Prez. Um, but... Uh, um, you know, it would put him, it would put him on the same level as Eagle McMahon for me, right? He's as talented. Mm-hmm. He'd have what technically one less major, but it's hard to count Kona Peach day. Um, you know, Trevor, you've struggled with that for a long time. I do too. So I, it would put him on that level for me where he's like, he is up there. Um, obviously he's pretty far back from your guys, like your Climo, your Barry Schultz, your Paul and your Ricky, because he only has one, but before without a major calvin's a really good disc golfer that had some really great and memorable wins with a major he becomes up there in that okay he he could be competing for the greatest of all time when it's all said and done okay so placing a lot of emphasis on the major victory which is you know warranted that is a lot of times the way we talk about disc golf after all um so my question then is dustin do you agree as I try to get Jack's points to actually settle down? Jack's at 17 points. There we go. I'm just going to say it. All right, Dustin, what are your thoughts? <laughs> okay, so when we're talking, we're having goat talk, right? And you said it's not time to have that with Calvin yet. But, Jack, it is time to have that with Calvin because that's what we do, right? We build excitement. We talk about the players that are in front of us. And he deserves to at least be in the discussion. Now, he's nowhere near the top right now. In fact, I'd put him, you know, maybe outside the top 10. I'm a huge, huge Calvin fan. I think the dude's awesome. He is a super talented player. And he's also playing against the most competitive fields that disc golf has ever seen. So we have to take that into effect. But all this is so subjective. So what I did is I said, what is it going to take to get Calvin into the top five? Because I think that top five GOAT discussion, really the top three is where you can really get in there. And, you know, right now you have uh, Paul McBeth's up there. Uh, Ken Climo's up there. Uh, Ricky's up there, I believe. Barry Schultz is up there. Feldberg, um, he's up there. You know, you got Nate Dawes, Will Schuster. You got all these guys that you can put in there. But, but one major to me, it would be huge for Calvin's career. It would be huge for um, his legacy. But I don't think one major gets you into the top five. I don't think that gets you into the GOAT discussion yet. I think there has to be multiple majors for him, and that hurts my heart because I think the world of him, and I think he's a great player. Simon, uh, I put him in the same category. Maybe the best thrower of the Frisbee like or the disc, in my opinion. I mean, that dude just does things that blows my mind, but he doesn't have that major. He doesn't have that big win that we we attach to him, so he's not going to be in that top five discussion. What what does it take to get there? It's going to take more than one major. I think it would take a world's champion to really get into the GOAT talk, uh, not just one major. But he would pass a lot of people. I could see him getting to five, the, that fifth spot with one major and a lot more wins. Uh, but he would definitely be, you know, kind of settling himself in the top ten because with his one win, he would pass a lot of other one major winners, two major winners, and even some world champions because I think he's that good and that consistent, and he's just that talented of a player. 
Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. I think when you think about Calvin just at face value, you're like, well, yeah, if he had, you know, if he had the major, surely that jumps him up, you know, well into the top five. But then, yeah, you think about it and you're like, you know, the, anybody can have the eras discussion, right? This isn't a, this isn't just a, who's the best disc golfer. This is a greatness kind of argument. So whenever you have those, you have to respect the, all the majors that a guy like Feldberg won and Klima won and Barry Schultz won, and it becomes a whole thing. So, um, yeah, here, the good news is he's really young, so he can win a whole bunch of majors. Um, Dustin, I'm going to give you the lag title today. Um, you, you did it. It's you third time or how many times on the show? Fifth time on the show? uh fourth or fifth it's my second fourth win so excited to be back on top there we go second win that's right i forgot you had one already are you going to catch yeah. other dustin for wins you know um i still wait to go head to head with him maybe uh yeah. <laughs> he, he puts a lot more words into his uh arguments than i do but hey one day maybe we'll get to find up Is that I can, a shot fired i can take the dustin title <laughs> <laughs> all right well if you uh if you're still if you're still watching the the uh, lag event of the of the season make sure to submit your topics on a debate night we had one fan submitted topic tonight uh you can scan the qr code on the screen or click the link in the description we do take these topics um we've had one for probably the last four or five weeks um we love putting them on the show we had a bunch come in after last week and i always love getting more topics i think we've had over 100 submitted uh through the season so far so make sure to keep submitting those thanks for supporting the show and uh we will see you next week with another episode the great the great disc golf debate would you rather play in wind or rain the great disc debate night debate would you rather have blurriness or lag Blurriness.